So uh, Pete Thompson's here. It's a Tuesday with Thompson. The PT's in the house as we got a lot of things to go over with Pete Thompson as he joins us now on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Uh, Peter, how are you? Good, bro. It's Mike. How are you? Happy Tuesday, boys. I uh, assume you didn't get well, bro. You might have got snowed in a little bit. Oh, I did. That's why I'm here at home yeah, today. Broach I, is, I got plastered. Bro yeah. is not in the studio today because uh, he sent me that text. Would it be cool if I just did the show from here and then he sends me the picture like uh, afterwards, the follow up? And I was like, well, what am I going to say to that? Yeah, it wasn't the lead punch. It was the second punch. Right, bro. That's how you got to do it. Yeah, I heard it was bad. I mean, it's all wet down here. I heard, Gil, I heard you talking the other day, MG, about how they always threaten that it's going to be something really bad and it turns out just to be rain or whatever. I mean, you know, but I feel, hey, the people that are uh, north into the west of us really got it. Yep, uh, I did see uh, people a little bit uh, north of us got a little bit more than we did, but as usual, we didn't get very much down here. Just a little wet road, a little rainy. Uh, my drive to work today was perfectly done. Hat tip to uh, the people uh, clearing off our streets down there and everything. They always do a great job, and uh, I, I appreciate them. My drive is not very far, uh, but, you know, it was it was nice and cleared off. All right, Peter, so we got a lot we want to dive into here on this Tuesday with Thompson. Let's start off with – why don't we start off with the Sixers and the difference in this team? Because last year it was it was painful. It was a bad year. It was painful. And we were just kind of rifting about – you know, Doc Rivers just won the coach of the year, and, or the coach of the month. Joel mm-hmm. B just won the uh, Eastern Conference Player of the Month. And Broads and I both are under the, you know, the, the, we were covering this conversation. We had it with Kevin Kincaid earlier. The biggest difference about this team is the readiness to win from Joel Embiid. Yeah, Joel's been a man, an absolute man, a monster, a beast, whatever word you want to say. And and I even tweeted out uh, the other night, I I couldn't believe that they won. I'd basically written them off for dead. You know, I leaned toward hockey first anyway. So I was watching the hockey game, kind of taking a glance at the Sixers game. And, you know, you look at a Sixers team and you see that they're down, what was it, 19 points or something like that, or 16 points with less than nine minutes left. They're down 16. You think, no way they're going to win this game. So you sort of write them off, and and it's a credit to the fact that, you know, Joel Embiid was not in that game, and they were able to have the other guys step up and win. And that resiliency, I mean, I know Broads doesn't like it, but Furkan, the people were going nuts about Furkan stepping up. It, it, it just, to me, says their depth is more. Obviously, the coaching is more. You know, I got a little – Got a little choked up when I saw uh, Doc Rivers say that we went to a John Cheney defense. We went to a zone. They had no idea what hit him. They didn't know how to handle it. Yeah, it's obvious that, um, you know, the other night they had to do something a little gimmicky almost the way that game was going. And it got them back in, which made us – we were talking to Kevin Kincaid about this earlier – is that something that they should incorporate a little bit more of is, hey, we have the pieces to make a zone work. You wonder why more teams don't do it because he said – you play the zone until a team figures it out. It feels like no one ever figures it out. Right. I think also, too, because nobody figures it out because they just you just don't see that that much in the NBA. Remember, didn't they used to call it an illegal defense? Wasn't zone an illegal defense back in the day? Wasn't you, that a penalty? Yeah, you could not play zone. It was only been recent, probably like the last five to seven years that you've been able to play zone. So why would you stop doing it? You know, especially you have the components that work it work, work with it the best. I mean, they have the horses to do it and the athletes to do it. And I heard you guys talking, and I knew that was the case, that, you know, if you got a guy in college that played mostly zone and he's all excited, that it's like the shackles come off. It's like the, 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 the governor on a golf cart. Hey, I can go as fast as I want. Woohoo! You know, I mean, uh, and they were so effective at it. Uh, why not slip it in a little bit more often? Yeah, I thought Coach Lineham said something really interesting on the post game, and he brought up that your playbook is 99% man-to-man. So when teams do throw this at you, it's like, well, we'll just run our man-to-man plays, and that'll beat them. But because no one ever thinks it's going to happen. So I, I do see, you know, the Miami Heat does it, and maybe now the Sixers work in their own kind of zone, and maybe it becomes a copycat league where you do see it more based on these results. And then... Yeah. It might not be as effective if teams are now more used to seeing it. Who knows? Right. I mean, part of the reason it worked is because nobody was expecting it and they just had no idea how to comprehend it. If you start doing it on a regular basis, teams will game plan for it. But like anything, in sports, your advantage is when you have to make the opponent game plan for something that you may or may not even use. If they spend 
20 minutes of an hour practice preparing for what might come out and then you don't use it, then you've already won. You've got an advantage. You're getting 20 minutes of them spending time on something that you did, a card you didn't even have to play. Uh, no, I thought it was a great thing. And, and, and like I said, I think they have the athletes for it. So why not go back to it? Yeah, and I know uh, a big topic of conversation has always been Simmons, and it seems that that has cooled down a little bit here. I, I, you know, I think you know Broads is a little bit on one side, and, and I'm on seemingly the other. I'm okay with what Ben has given this team, um, but I, I guess the question would be like, is it okay if Joel, like we feel like Joel has maybe maturity wise become ready to win? Is Ben there? I think we see glimpses of Ben being there. I'm with you, Gil. I don't need Ben to light up the numbers as far as the points because there's so many other pieces around him, although it was nice to see a season high 21.7 assists, uh, six rebounds, four steals, and two blocks. I mean, that's whoa, Ben, right? But uh, I look at it like this. Joel has really taken his game to another level, and I think he's finally emerged into what could be uh, not just the team MVP, but potential league MVP in the numbers that he puts up each night. Uh, he realizes how important he is to the Sixers and their success, although they did win without him. They were 0-4 before that, and, you know, uh, they're a much different team without him. And I, I just I think we're seeing the maturity of Joel Embiid. I, I don't look at Ben as having to be the superstar numbers, but I do look at Ben as having to be Ben, which is the guy that distributes the basketball, the guy that gets a few steals, that, that shuts down the other team's uh, high score or gets the other guy frustrated, whoever that top score is. You know, so I think Ben does a lot of things that don't necessarily jump out. People just gravitate toward how many points did somebody score. There's a whole lot more to basketball than how many points he ended up with in your total points in that column. Pete Thompson, this is the best I've, uh, the most uh, I've ever agreed with you. <laughs> it's crazy, right? See what happens? Two days of snow and I'm stuck in the house and all of a sudden I'm reading <laughs> Sixers coverage left and right. And you and I are on the same page. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens. You start to go crazy when you get stuck inside. I mean, it's probably one big snowball effect from just being quarantined forever. We start going psycho. We start believing what Gil says. It's unbelievable. <laughs> but uh, last, last segment we brought up, you know, Embiid taking this team to that next step. And, and let's say Embiid's ready. Ben Simmons isn't. And being ready, Joel, brings you to the Eastern Conference Finals. So you do take that step to the next round. Could you imagine the frustration? And look, I'm on, I'm not giving away Ben for nothing. So I am frustrated with him, realizing what he does do so well. Uh, but I just I can't imagine that frustration that would happen with this fan base if you watch Embiid really develop and grow to the point where he takes you that next step. And then it's almost as if, well, Ben is holding this team back from taking it even further, how do you think uh, th this fan base would respond to that? Well, I mean, now, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about, Ben, the reason that you lost a series? I mean, and how do you pinpoint, like, in what way does is he the reason you lost the series? Is it because he didn't score enough? That's not necessarily way, maybe I'll throw role. it. I'll throw it this way at you. The, the way that teams defend you is basically because you realize that Ben Simmons, because we've seen right. this over okay. the last couple of years. All right, I'll take that point. So you're saying there's four-fifths of a team out there. Don't worry about the 6'10 guy. He ain't going to shoot it anyway. We'll just collapse down on this guy. All right, that's a valid point, and I can see that in my mind. But I think that was something that took place a lot more with the old Sixers makeup, where you literally had like Joel, maybe a little bit of Ben, and nobody else. You know, the weapons that they're starting to put around him, that we're seeing the best that we've seen, knock on wood, of Tobias Harris. We're seeing the best that we've seen so far of some of the perimeter shooting, you know, uh, Seth Curry and what he could do. You know, uh, e even in limited doses, when you get Dwight Howard in there for the energy he brings in, you know, we're seeing a good version of the Sixers team, so much so that I actually had a thought when I saw that J.J. Redick was a possibility of coming back to the Sixers, I was like, I don't know. Don't we have it? I mean, there's only so many, so only so many minutes to go around, and that's crazy. You know, it used to be that I'd be like, "Oh yeah, we need a shooter." You know, uh, we absolutely need a guy from the outside, and now I'm like, I don't know if we really need that guy or not. And that's that's almost unfathomable to me to to see where we are from last year to now this year. This feels like that moment in um, what movie was that with John Favreau and. Um... <laughs> Swingers, when he's like, you're all grown up and you're all grown up, PT. Look at you. Like, you uh, finally yeah. have fallen out of the trap of being like, well, he played for the Sixers and I liked him. Yeah, bring him back. Like, every Philly fan always wants to bring the guy back. And you have finally said, eh, I don't think we really need that guy here. Good for you, Peter. 
Right. And certainly not at the cost of giving up some young talent, young talent that, uh, you know, everybody seems to go after. Right. I mean, there's a reason that when the James Harden talk came out that Maxie's name kept coming up. There's a reason Matisse Thibel's name comes up. You know, guys, these are young players that, you know, have a high, high ceiling and they're not even there yet. And uh, that would be, you know, you. Plus, uh, you'd have to make the money work and all. I mean, uh, come on, uh, you know, uh, look, uh, just don't let them go to Brooklyn. That's all I'm saying. Well, I think one of the big differences, and I think, by the way, what Broads' point is valid. Yeah, four on five. Four the four on teams. five sure. playoff yeah. time. The difference is, I don't, I, I think what you said, Pete, is, is valid too, is they were four on five because their roster was – constructed in a way that almost made them three on five because Mm -hmm. Al Horford couldn't shoot from the outside, so they didn't have to worry about him. Josh Richardson was a guy you didn't have to worry about. The only two guys you really had to worry about in the half-court game was Joel Embiid and, I guess, Tobias Harris. Like, they just didn't have – so it tightened the screws to Ben. I don't think teams can do that, and if they can, God bless them, but I just don't see how teams – can implore the same defensive principles with this team that they could on previous teams. Yeah, and I think you hit the nail on the head, too, there. Uh, and you, you guys talked about Coach Lynham the other night. You know, Coach Lynham always – the playoffs are a half-court game. You know, you, you watch a whole season where there's a lot of uh, full-court basketball and all that, and then once it gets down to the playoffs, it all of a sudden metamorphosizes or switches to just this intense half-court battle. And – you know, teams have to be built for that and be ready for that. And uh, I think the Sixers are more ready for that than ever before. All right, PT, let's transition to a little hockey, huh? Yeah, little, why not, eh? <laughs> yeah, well, you know what I mean? I guess I'm taking control here. Let's go to the Flyers. They win two, two against the Islanders. Now, both in overtime and some hideous play throughout, as we've seen to this point. But what are your takeaways from the uh, the two games? I mean, my first takeaway is, is exactly what you're touching on is the fact that, like, I think I my tweet was something along the lines of how in the heck did they win that hockey game? And you could have used that for either game. You could have used that for Saturday, and you could have used it for Sunday. I mean, both times uh, there were periods, long periods of time where the Flyers did not look effective, were making mistakes, let the Islanders back in it. Look, the Islanders are a really good hockey team. There's a reason they were the team that advanced and the Flyers weren't out of the play, out of that round of the playoffs last year. But the difference is you got a top uh, Carter Harder than Brian Elliott played well the other night. You got good goaltending. You've got good depth along your lines. And you've got just this resilience, too. I mean, listen, a good Shane Goss bear. That was the other part of my tweet, too, on the game winner. I actually said out loud, good job, Ghost. I haven't said that, I think. Since his rookie season when he was scoring game winners, I said out loud, good job, Ghost, and then boom, the game-winning goal was in the back of the net. I think that was Saturday night's game, if I'm not mistaken. So, look, I'll take uh, – winning ugly is still winning, you know, and I'll take ugly wins over uh, L any day of the week. And, you know, now we're going to see more how they do against Boston because that's another elite team, and obviously uh, tomorrow night that's a – primetime matchup you know the eight o'clock the national audience will see if they show well but they're still making mistakes and they're winning i'll take it yeah the mistakes is crazy to me Uh, i mean i just i don't understand how it got this abysmal defensively and you get phil myers back and things look a little bit better and like you said ghost isn't playing horrendous i i just wonder with the ghost thing are we just accustomed to robert haig and 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 Justin Braun right now being so bad that we are, like, brainwashed with ghosts. Like, wow, a defenseman that can make a pass. Right. I mean, and that's what's crazy, too. Uh, you miss Matt, Matt Niskanen. We all know that, right? What a steadying influence he was, right? Provorov is Provorov. He's good. He's always steady Eddie out there, and he plays so many minutes. But then, really, right now, and I don't know about you, Broads, but I look at their roster, and I see one NHL defenseman and five I'm in an NHL uniform. Give, give, San, trying San my a, give Sandheim right. a little more credit. All right, I'll give two then. You know, yeah. but like <laughs> but Phil, because Phil Myers was out. Phil Myers is a legitimate NHL defenseman. Now you're mixing him in. So if you want to go Prober off Sandheim and Myers, now you've got three. Justin Braun is a guy that when he makes turnovers, I scream at the television. Gustafson replaced Ghost as my new uh, guy that I scream and yell at the TV. What are you doing? What are you doing? Right. And then Hank, I'm curious touristically has made mistakes, uh, you know, in the early going here too. So they are by no means 
Uh, and that's why, listen, that's why you have a taxi squad. That's why you keep eight. That's why you saw the guy Prosser up the other night. What the hell was he doing in the lineup, right? I didn't even know who he was. Scoring hey, goals guy, is what he was doing right? in the lineup. It was unbelievable. He goes from taxi squad to big league lineup to right back to taxi squad once Phil Myers was available. But I love that, too, because you know what it is, Gil? Uh, that's it. And when they sat Travis Konechny and everybody was like, oh, my God, they're sitting TK. That is a coach that is holding his stars accountable. If you don't play the way that I want you to play, I don't care how many points you have. I don't care how good you are in the offensive end. You are awful in the defensive end, and you are going to sit. And that's why Travis Konechny sat the other night, because against the Devils, he let the forwards get too deep. He let himself get too deep and got caught, and that led to odd man rushes in the other way. And basically, A.B. had seen it up, so he sent a little message Put him as healthy scratch, and he came out like he was shot out of a cannon in the second game. All right. Uh, I guess it worked. Pete Thompson, how would you kind of describe what we're getting and seeing from one JVR? Uh, that's what they that's what they signed up for. We're getting the JVR that they traded for. We're getting the JVR that they hoped for. We're getting the JVR who, like, uh, and I'm going to go to way back old time, old time hockey names. Uh, Dino Cicerelli used to do that. Uh, back for the Minnesota North Stars. Tim Kerr, there you go, Gil, did that for the Philadelphia Flyers. Guys that set up in their office that's right in front of the net. You know, I remember one time being in the Flyers locker room and asking Mike Ritchie, who was never uh, – Richards, excuse me, who was never a, a big, eloquent talker about, like, a, a, gar- a garbage goal in front. And I brought up Dino Cicerelli's name, and his eyes, like, went as big as saucers. And he kind of, like, was nodding at me like – Finally, there's a guy in here that understands what the heck he's talking about. You have to have traffic in front of the net. JVR is, you know, from the pretty goals, which are like that tip goal or those deflection goals that he works on so hard in practice, to just creating the presence in front where it occupies the defenseman and the goalie's attention so that a puck can squeak by. That's the JVR that they wanted to bring back, and now he's finally here. Yeah, I know – it's uh, Tim Saunders when I love that call on the radio. He gets a goal with traffic in front of the net. You know, like uh, <laughs> Saunders giving you that little, uh, uh, you know, play-by-play there. All right, let's transition real quick, PT, over to the Phils, who got DD and JT signed in the last week here. So expectations change at all? Okay, and this is the so – a listener brought this up the other day. All right. And I want to get your thoughts on it because it's, I don't want to say it's changed my thoughts, but I think it's definitely worth bringing in, which is they have the same offense, which was pretty good last year. They have the same pitching rotation, which was good, not great. Their bullpen was so bad. <laughs> it can't be as bad, and they have added better pieces. Right. So is simply fixing the bullpen and bringing the band back together Enough. Well, uh, I'll echo this. On the offensive side of things, uh, I re- I'm glad they brought back JT. I'm glad they brought back Dee. I think both those guys are good fits in the lineup, especially JT. I know he, uh, you know, the fan base would have gone nuts if they lost him. And and of course, uh, who's the guy for the Marlins? Six, though, right? If he blew up down there, uh, and that's one thing. The second thing is, is will JT Real Muto be the same guy at 35 that he is at 30? We'll find out, but. But I'm okay with bringing those bats back. You hit the nail on the head, though. It's all about the bullpen. We've talked before about the velocity they're adding. And you see, I think they made another move, too, for this Hector Rondon, right? I mean, it's a minor league contract. But they're just trying to add arms anywhere they can. And, you know, to me, Gil, the bullpen in baseball is like the offensive line in football. You can never have enough quality arms You can never have enough guys that can effectively play offensive line. And last year, the Phillies kind of gambled on the fact like, oh, we'll be okay with what we have. And they were dog dirt awful. So I think to me this year, they're trying to get as many people in there, get as many guys in there and get a workable, serviceable, good. It doesn't have to be a Cy Young bullpen start to finish. It just has to be guys that are somewhat effective at getting people out, especially if they have a big lead going into it. I'd be okay with that too. Yeah, I know – that bullpen is not going to be great, but it's definitely got to be an upgrade over what we saw last year. That was that was painful to watch. Can you imagine having to go through 162 of those? No, I, I really can't. And, uh, you know, God bless uh, Girardi for not uh, jumping off the wall whipping or anything like that. I mean, it, it, uh, it it's brutal to sit there and see what took place last year, and I just don't think they could go through something like that again. So, uh, like you said, yeah, I, I – 
they don't have to be all stars and uh, top to bottom like unbelievable arms. They just have to be better than they were last year, and that's that old quote. There's nowhere to go but up. So, Pete Thompson, we started today's show with this, and we'll ask your your opinion on this. The latest mock draft that we saw at NFL.com has the the Eagles selecting a tight end with the sixth pick. And whoa, look at your reaction there. Wow, there you go. Stuck. With wow. the sixth pick in the draft taking Kyle Pitts, a tight end from the University of Florida. I guess you can describe Uh, to the people who didn't see the video, but you would be pretty shocked. I mean, when's the last time they took a tight end in the uh, draft? Was it Keith Jackson out of Oklahoma? Is that the last time they took a tight end? In the first round. I mean, they took Goddard and Ertz. Both were in the second round. Yeah, I have no problem with that. A tight end in the first round? Who who are the five people that are going ahead of them that you have to – a tight end is the best you can do. Uh, all, all the receivers are gone. The LSU kids gone. The Alabama kids gone. Well, tight end. I mean, listen. I don't. I don't know a lot about this Florida tight end, other than the fact that he better be the next coming of Travis Kelsey or or the early years of Jimmy Graham. You know. I mean, come on. You you better be a tight end that really is like a receiver. Well, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I mean, you look at the way the league has tra- like changed, and you have Dallas Goddard. That's the difference. But, you know, I wonder if Nick Sirianni just wants to utilize something heavier with this 12 personnel set. And knowing Carson Wentz is comfortable with tight ends, is that a statement towards him? I'm not saying that I'm sitting here rooting for it by any means, but if, if you're – philosophy this offseason is we need a playmaker on offense so you want to lean towards wide receiver so I I think it would only be fair to have him in the mix just in terms of like hey if we're trying to get a playmaker why wouldn't he at least be in the conversation yeah I mean if he is that kind of tight end and he's he's a league changing sort of tight end I can understand maybe why that would get serious discussion but to me you know, I think that you, you want to go with either a, a, a wide receiver at that position if you can, if those guys are available. But what or, if you, uh, what if they think the tight end is better? And that's my point. Is like, if, are you just taking a receiver just because of the position? What if they actually say this guy Pitts is better than the receiver? Yeah, was well, the receiver Devonte Smith that won the Heisman, or the kid from LSU, Jamar Chase? I mean, if that's the case, then I want to grab Howie and go. Burr! Shake him. <laughs> well, I mean, come, come on, on, PT. You've been logical all day. I don't think uh, Gil's yeah. going to look at that one as a logical one. Well, the point I'm making is the Eagles' top receiver in the Wentz era has been a tight end every year. It yeah. has been either Ertz or Goddard, and one year it was both of them. They were one and two. So, And we heard um, Nick Sirianni basically say he wants to run 12 personnel. Mm. So would it help? Wentz feel more comfortable and gives Sirianni what he wants. Well, and then and the tight end routes are not deep routes, and maybe uh, Carson Wentz gets more accurate all of a sudden because he's got not one but two tight ends in there that he can throw the ball to, and it's impossible for linebackers to cover him. I mean, uh, you're starting to sell me on this idea, but I, I don't say that I'm really excited about it. By the way, uh, or he could be not- LJ. He could be LJ Smith. And oh then he would- God, that's that's my problem. God bless you, LJ, wherever the heck you are. But uh, that would be bad. Uh, listen, this is all I know, guys. I finally watched. Sirianni's press conference. Because remember, I missed it on Friday, and I was kind of just going off what I heard. Wow. Holy cow, that does not inspire me. Uh, can we talk about the system one more time, and the system, and the system we're going to run, and the system is, what the heck? You're on, oh, my God. So hopefully he gets better. Uh, he's like uh, he's like the Phillies bullpen. <laughs> Nick Sirianni in the Phillies bullpen. Nowhere to go but up. <laughs> yeah, I think the first quote that he, he started out with there when he was going with the core values was like, the first part of being smart is knowing what to do. And I'm like, ooh, God, ooh, that's – I don't think yeah. that was strong. It's like he was reading a recipe out of the cookbook or something. I mean, like, you know, step one – Disassemble crib. Step two. <laughs> what is the Allen wrench again? Step three. Find screws. Like, dude, what are you doing? Dude. This is a national press conference, and you're the head coach of the Philadelphia freaking Eagles. Uh, Pete Thompson, have you watched Your Honor? Uh, Your Honor, Your Honor, I have not. Tell me more about it. I was wondering because I thought you were the one who I, I can't figure out who's the one who. It's uh, Brian Cranston who's the judge. Oh, uh, is it called Your Honor or Honor? I, I did see a couple episodes of that. He's like a judge, and his son hits somebody with his car or something yeah. like that. Right? Yep, it's yep. real dark and deep. And yeah, I, I was really riveted by it. I haven't watched the whole thing. I started it, and then something got me called away. That's the word I used yesterday, bro. It's riveting. It's a riveting show. I'm two yeah. episodes in, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. 
Now, Gil, if you like that, go back and watch Kelsey Grammer in Boss. That was also on Showtime, and it was set in Chicago, which, of course, we know uh, there's nothing like a good Chicago politician, dead or alive, right, corrupt or not. So uh, uh, Kelsey Grammer, who you're used to seeing as like Frazier or the jolly guy, plays like a alderman or like a boss, basically, in Chicago that runs all the things behind the scenes. So if you like that theme, that kind of theme of dark and, and riveting, watch that one, too. Boss, I recommend that, too. Thanks, Peter. All right, it's a Tuesday with Thompson. He's Pete Thompson. He'll be back for happy hour Friday uh, right before Super Bowl 55, so we'll get his pick on the Friday show. And, of course, he, like all guests, appeared via the Boardwalk Honda hotline. All right, Peter, see you, man. All right, guys, have a good rest of the show.